You know, I thought a long time about writing this book and how a how a day and an evening like this would come. So uh, it's it's really quite something to to be here, and I and I really appreciate and I really appreciate you all turning out. Uh, the genesis of this book uh, this book began in 2009. I was uh, covering the festival for the journal, and 2009 was the 50th anniversary year. Uh, so they sent me to New York to spend a day with George Ween. Uh, we spoke for about an hour at his apartment. Then we went to a Newport Jazz Festival event, uh, some fancy thing with finger food and saxophones. <laughs> and, I, uh, and then we went back to his apartment for about three more hours. And he told me his eye view of the entire history of the festival. And as I'm, uh, George Ween, I should say, founded the Newport Folk Festival. He is going to be 92 in October, and he's, uh, he's a wonder. He's just a wonder and a wonderful man. And I'm on the train back, and I'm starting to work out this series of stories that I'm going to write for the journal. And I realized that you could actually make a book out of this. And my first thought was, well, I, somebody obviously has, because, I mean, how could you not? And, uh, you know, it was a, there was a long process of convincing myself that nobody had actually done that yet. And, uh, and here we are. <laughs> so I guess I, uh, it seems, seems wise to start with the introduction. So here's a bit from the introduction, and uh, hopefully it won't put you off uh, buying the book too much. Uh, let's see. Newport started off with the goal of pre presenting a form of music that was topping the charts in an era when rock and roll was still establishing a foothold and it stepped into the controversies engendered by that popularity. It continued as what one observer called Woodstock without drugs and electric or electric guitars, a multi-day hangout that explored the power of music to change minds and by extension the world, while at the same time, and partially by dint of, keeping alive long forgotten musical traditions, all years before the more celebrated Woodstock Rock Festival. The, fest the original festival reached its cultural apogee in 1965 when it hosted the first electric performance by the already legendary Bob Dylan, a moment that wasn't unforeseen, but, but it catalyzed the argument over what had happened to Dylan, to folk music, and to rock music in the six years since the festival had begun. But the brush fire that Dylan's performance ignited didn't illuminate the Newport Folk Festival. It left scorched earth in its place. Dylan's performance was a key step in the process of rock's emergence as a music that could speak to the hearts and minds of America's young people. And over the rest of the 60s, the folk festival became a symbol of a worn out genre looking for a reason to exist, an annual gathering of people in a field to wait for a second lightning strike. When the festival went down in a thicket of red tape and red ink, helped along by an incident of violence at its big brother, the Newport Jazz Festival, it was worthy of a two-line announcement in 1971, and not many people cared. In the mid-1980s, the festival came back to life as a different beast, where it had been a non-profit, utopian, determinedly egalitarian presentation on stage and backstage, in which everyone from Bob Dylan to the fiddler for the Greenbrier Boys got $50 a day. It reemerged as a sleek, commercial, corporately sponsored weekend of individual concerts. The version of the, that, this version of the festival lasted longer than any others have so far. By the early 21st century, however, by the early 21st century, however, attendance and enthusiasm had waned once again. Even the Indigo Girls, the festival's most reliable draw of the 1990s, couldn't attract an audience. A after dropping out of Ween's control for two years, the festival finished its first half century with its founder back at the helm and a reinvigorated focus. The festival presents a mix of music much of which doesn't seem to fit into a folk festival until you hear it at one. And it thrives under a new leader, handpicked by Ween and his lieutenants, whose relative youth inspires him not to ignore the festival's past, but to recognize, honor, and use its iconic stature among a new generation. 
thanks to technological advances in communication and a, and a youth culture that in many ways echoes that of folks' glory days, the festival participates like never before in the celebration and creation of its own history. Uh, let's see. Each year, the conscious acts of gathering performers and attract through the conscious acts of gathering performers and attracting audiences, the Newport Folk Festival asks anew and tries to an answer and tries to answer anew two questions: What is folk music, and what can it do? Over the decades, the debate has not only continued but grown to include related questions: Is it folk music if it's a professional musician singing it? Is it folk music if it has an electric guitar? Is it folk music if it's popular? Is it folk music if it's not popular? Is it folk music if it's presented with the help of a corporate sponsor? Is it folk music if you have to plug your ears? These, these questions weren't first asked at Newport, and they've never been answered. Indeed, they may never be. And in fact, most of the people who ask these questions know that, but they ask anyway. John Cohen, who played at the first Newport Folk Festival with the Newport, New Lost City Ramblers in 1959, said at a panel discussion in 2015, maybe the festival needs controversies. Perhaps even more accurately, maybe the fans do. Through the years, the festival and the questions behind it have made different sounds. The earth moving power of Odetta in 1959, the big dreaming group singing We Shall Overcome of 1963, the electric shock of Bob Dylan in 1965, the out and proud Indigo Girls who made nine appearances in 10 years in the 1990s, the radio, strum, the radio ready strumming and shouting of the Lumineers today. But to hear the people who were and are there tell it, it feels like one conversation stretched out over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So the festival began in 1959. What happened was that uh, George Ween, who was the co-founder of the Newport Jazz Festival, he ran a nightclub in Boston called Storyville. And it was mainly a jazz nightclub, but he would have Pete Seeger come play. He had, he had folk acts come play sometimes. And one of the acts he brought in was Odetta. And she came in for what they call the eight day week. Uh, you would play uh, seven uh, shows on seven nights in a row, and you do a matinee on Sunday. And it was, Odetta was very popular at the time, but these shows were, not at all a success. Um, and the only, the only show that was packed that people actually went to was the Sunday matinee. And it was all Harvard students and MIT students and Cambridge kids coming in and drinking ginger ale and sitting there for the entire show. So George Reed probably still lost money on that. But he realized there's, there's something going on here. He's, he was a jazz guy. He still is a jazz guy. He's a jazz piano player from Brockton. He did not realize the what folk music was, was at the time because you had acts like the Kingston Trio and the, uh, and the Brothers Four and the Chad Mitchell Trio. And these, these guys were selling records. You know, rock and roll at the time was, it was kind of in its Fabian phase. So there was a, there was a bit of a vacuum. And so this is what, so this folk music sort of filled this void. If you were, if you were, a, if you were a young person and you, you were, you know, you were looking for something that engaged the world as you saw it and sort of rebelled against uh, against the society around you a little bit, you were into folk music. And this was the, this was the, the moment that uh, that George Ween realized this, and that's when he decided to in partnership with Odetta's manager, Albert Grossman, he decided to have a folk afternoon at the jazz festival, and then he decided, no, let's just do a folk festival. Mm -hmm. So that, that happened for two years, and then they went out of, they went out of, they got kicked out of Newport because there was a riot at the Newport Jazz Festival, which seems like something you probably wouldn't think would happen uh, <laughs> uh, nowadays, and it probably wouldn't. But uh, that is, in fact, what happened, and Newport kicked both festivals out. That didn't last very long, and in 1963, the folk festival began again, but it was very different this time. Uh, it, it was, this time, 
the guiding light of it. There's always George, and then there's his guiding light, or his native guide, as I call it in the book. And first, it was first it was Albert Grossman, and the second one, when they started in 1963, restarted in 1963, was Pete Seeger. And his idea, it was really his wife's idea, but he, he, he stumped for it and insisted on it. Uh, the festival was a nonprofit. They formed a nonprofit corporation, and they said, "We are going to pay everybody fifty dollars a day, whether you are the fiddler of the Greenbrier Boys or you are Bob Dylan or Joan Baez. You're getting fifty dollars a day." And they used the proceeds as a as a fund that would they 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 used it as a foundation. They gave grants to organizations and foundations all over the country to encourage the the promotion and the revitalization of ethnic and regional music across the country. Uh, one of the um, uh, but one of the things uh, one of the things that happened, of course, in that era of the festival was Bob Dylan going electric. Um, his first electric performance was at the Newport Folk Festival in 1965. It was a rather a thing. Um, <laughs> people were, uh, people loved it, people hated it, people were outraged by it, people were inspired by it, and when I was trying to come to grips with this and make a chapter out of it, I had no idea what I was going to do about this. Uh, if you want to hear the tapes, you can hear the tapes. And so I felt like, okay, that that's pretty much objectively known, but what the heck am I going to say about this kaleidoscope of reactions and, uh, and impressions that people had? And that's when I realized that the thing to do was to put them side by side, uh, to use the juxtaposition of the different of the different reactions, and you know, and use the use the cut, uh, make people you know tell the story of it through the cut between the different uh, uh, the different reactions and um, uh, the different the different very strong opinions that. That people had of it. Uh, one of the things that also happened in that time is that the festival was very attached to the civil rights movement. Uh, there were there were uh, booths and exhibitor uh, booths and exhibitor uh, displays at the festival. Uh, but even more importantly, it just it sort of it gave the um, it gave the it, it, it gave the example. It gave a, a platform for, for people to 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 agitate for a a more integrated, fairer kind of world. Uh, and one of the things that really struck me when I was talking to George Ween is that, and I used it as the as the title to the introduction. Uh, people think this stuff just happens. And he said, it doesn't. There's thinking behind it. And that's something that he always felt that people thought he was kind of a businessman who was sort of along for the ride as far as the, the popularity of, of folk music went. And it was actually a very important thing to him that this was an integrated event, a very politically progressive event. Uh, one time th that that afternoon that I was that I was speaking with George in his apartment, we were talking about about exactly that, and he was saying that. Well, he told the story he's told many times of uh, on on one of the buses uh, from where the play the many places where the performers were staying to the festival grounds. There was a white sacred harp group from Alabama, I believe it was, on board the bus, and the bus was completely full. And then the Georgia Sea Island singers came on board, and they're an African-American traditional group. They're 
fantastic. You have to look them up. And it was, and everyone sort of looked at each other. And this was only a couple of years after the, a few years anyway, after the, after the Montgomery bus boycott. And everybody looked at each other for a couple of minutes. And, and the, the, the Sacred Harp singers got up and offered their seats to the Georgia Sea Island singers. Uh, one thing that people don't always know is that uh, George, Ween's, George Ween's wife, Joyce Ween, was uh, African American. And they got married in 1959. At that point, their marriage was still illegal in 19 states. So this is something that was important to, to the both of them, and it was something that it was important that their festivals reflect. And during this, during this conversation that we had, he told me the, the story of the bus. He told me the story of how Joyce would be directing traffic backstage. You go over there, you go over there, you go over there. And you know these guys in these cowboy hats from Georgia or whatever, you know, she goes, okay, you gotta go over there, but you, your set's been delayed, so you're gonna have to wait about 15 minutes, but I need you over there right now, and then we can, we can deal with it from there. And they would just do what, they, do what she said, and then they would come back and tell George, your, your wife is about the finest woman we've ever met. And he said, uh, very beautiful things happened at the festival. And then he went on to talk about uh, how wild the waterfront in Newport was with these bucket of blood bars, which is one of those, which is one of those phrases I, I have no idea. I just let him go because I, I don't even know what that, I don't want to know what that is. I, I've, I've probably been in such places without knowing it. Um, bucket of blood bars with, uh, uh, along the shore featuring bands playing shit kicker music all night. And I waited and you know, I'm not much of a 60 Minutes gotcha investigative reporter, but I knew that he had said very beautiful things happened. And I was like, yeah, they happened, right? So I waited for him to, you know, the buckets of blood, the shit kicker music, the, the, the knife fights, the, the wild, yeah, okay, okay, George. And he finally, you know, wore himself out of it. And I said, you knew what you were doing. And he knew what I was talking about. And over the next half hour, we related examples of ways his business intersected with the world as it was and how he wanted to be, what he thought he had helped to change, and his frustrations over what he perceived as an assumption on the part of folk music observers that he was at most a passive observer to all of it. The Jazz Festival was an instruction on how, on how things could be if people worked together, we said. Jazz was ahead of its time but it wasn't political in its integration, it was personalized integration. The folk festival was very political. Uh, the jazz festival was more demonstrative in the, in the mixing of musicians, but the political stance that the folk festival took created some people against it and more people for it. It was an exciting situation. I can't say we were colorblind. I knew that we had to do these things if we were gonna be a representation of what we were supposed to do. You know the. One of the stories he told me, I mean, you know, you could go on for hours, but one of the things, one of the stories he told me, not directly about the Newport Folk Festival, but about the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, which he helped to begin. Uh, he had, he had, they, they brought, the people in New Orleans brought him down there uh, to talk about, um, uh, to talk about, you know, setting up a festival there. And he said, that's, that's great. But, they wanted a segregated festival, segregated audiences, segregated bands. He said, well, I, I can't do that. I mean, you know, you got, uh, you know, you got, you got the biggest names in jazz. They all have integrated bands and they all have clauses in their contracts. They're not gonna, they're not gonna play for segregated audiences. So he said, okay. And two years later, they called him back and said, you know, it, it, he said they're trying they're, they're trying to figure out a way around their own laws here. It was a little funny for him to uh, to see. So they called him back and said, "Okay, the 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 the, the integrated thing that's okay." So then there was a uh, but then they wouldn't let um, uh, the American Football League All Star Game was in New Orleans that year, 
and they wouldn't let the black and white players stay in the same hotel. And he said, well, I don't know what to tell you. I, that's not going to... That's not going to fly with the people you want to have come to play. So, that was it. They, um, uh, then in 1968, they said, all right, that's okay too. We are, <laughs> we are going to, we're going to do this. We're going to have a, uh, we're going to have a New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. And we're going to have Willis Conover run it. And just, why are you going to have Willis Conover run it? Well, George... You know, everything else is okay, but you're married to a black woman, and that's just, that's, that's going to be a problem. I said, okay. And uh, he said, uh, all right, well, you know, finally in 1969, they, he, uh, they called him back down. They said, <laughs> and they said, we want, we want you to run. He said, well, what about Willis Conover? They said, well, we fired Willis Conover. <laughs> and now, the, after that, George Ween ran the, New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, which continues today. And one of the things that I, I one, of the, one of the quotes that made me want to write this book, he said, that's been my life. I lived an integrated life. And everywhere I went, I, I think I left my mark with people. I never wanted to be a rebel. I never thought I was doing anything different by marrying Joyce. I wanted the same kind of respect my father had as a doctor. I wasn't going to live an outsider's life. I was part of society. And to this day, I still am. And that's why I've lasted all these years, I think. I don't compromise, but at the same time, I don't tell anyone else they're wrong. They have to find out that they're wrong. <laughs> and they'll find out. <laughs> I love that, man. So, unfortunately, after the... Uh, after Bob Dylan went electric in 1965, it became, he became a rock star, essentially. And he began to live in, in the world of rock music. And the sort of hybrid known as folk rock came into existence at that point. And that became, and obviously the Beatles were a big, uh, a big influence here as well, but what happened is if you were a kid if you were sort of a dissident kid, a kid with an axe to grind, uh, you did not just have to listen to folk music to get something that was outside of the outside of the commercial mainstream. You could listen to rock and roll and hear insights into the into the world around you that sort of made you feel like like you weren't alone in, in looking at this society and saying, This is kind of messed up. That was great. That may have been great for music in general, but that sort of left the, the Newport Folk Festival saying, well, what are we going to do now? And they couldn't just, you know, go ahead and have the next Bob Dylan, and they couldn't just go ahead and, uh, you know, they tried to go back to something a bit more traditional, uh, you know, with, with bluegrass singers and country blues singers, which they had always had. Don't get me wrong, but they had. This was kind of they, they, this was going to kind of be the selling point at this point, and as a as a mark of of cultural and and aesthetic importance, it was great. It was not so much as a selling point. So crowds were still coming to the festivals, but it was it didn't have the same sort of sense of purpose. It was costing because it kind of the flip side of the $50 a day thing, it was costing just as much money to put Buell Casey up there as, as Bob Dylan. But you weren't getting the same kind of, you weren't getting the same kind of return. In fact, it may have cost more to, it may have cost more to bring some, some of the South African singers and the, uh, and the, and the Brazilian musicians who they, who they would bring up. And so the foundation started losing money uh, the crowds were still a hassle with Newport, which is understandable. I mean, at the time, Newport had about 20,000, 20 or 20 to 40,000 people living in the city, and then uh, they would have uh, 72,000 people coming for the festival. So that was that was a bit of a problem with the town, and. Essentially, what I what I what I explained in the book is that 
uh, no, no good idea falls apart all at once. And that's basically what brought down Newport was a succession of problems and expenses and essentially bad vibes. So they closed down after the 1969 festival. They had a 1970 festival planned and they canceled it. And then, uh, then there was a riot, another riot at the 1971 uh, Newport Jazz Festival, which is kind of stunning because uh, if you, well, if you think, well, if you think jazz is, if you think the idea of jazz is riot causing music is going to be, uh, is, is something, the 1971 riot, well, it had been brewing for a while, but it actually broke out when, uh, during Dionne Warwick singing What the World Needs Now. <laughs> I sort of wish I was there. Uh, you were there? I want you to do the rest of this presentation. I, I read, I looked up in your book, I said, I wonder if it's in there. And I it. And then you mentioned Dionne Warwick. I was cheek to cheek with Dionne Warwick on stage as she was getting off. How I got up there, my uncle was a detail cop, Newport Police Officer. Yeah. And that was his, you know, area back there. Right. And so, getting out of the chair, the wooden chairs, they have wooden chairs, yeah, yeah. and the snow fence, and I leapt over the snow fence and didn't make it all the way. <laughs> oh. And didn't feel anything at the time. No, I imagine. And that. I continued going and I saw my uncle and he's escorting Dion Warwick off stage and I'm going up stage and we were like cheek to cheek. <laughs> this is the this is the greatest thing ever. What was, <laughs> what, was, um, what, was um, what was her reaction? What was she thinking? Oh she was she was in a panic. She sure. Was, she was stiff, you know. No, I mean they destroyed yeah. the piano. They yeah. were you wow. know Yeah, no, they were not kidding. Mm -hmm. This is uh you know, George Wien calls them the music should be free crowd. It was, you know, that was that was the thing. They were outside the festival, and they were, you know, Woodstock was free, even though it wasn't supposed to be, but nobody knows that. Uh, Woodstock was free. This should all be free. And you know, this is this is this is sort of what they were up against. And the other thing is, there were no, um, uh, you know, there's the the late sixties and early seventies were the era of the major uh, outdoor rock festival, but the summer of 1971 was an exception. There weren't any that summer. And so the Newport Jazz Festival was kind of the next best thing. <laughs> anyway, and there was... was I was just saying, might want to get a, continue, continue. No, no, no. I, I, I want to leave, leave some things up to people's imagination so they want to read the whole book. Sure. <laughs> I want people to read the whole book. People read the book. So, all right, so they came back and everything's cool. No. Uh, <laughs> no. What happened is that um, what happened is that they, they came back in 1985. Uh, in the meantime, what had happened in Newport is that uh, the naval base left. The um, uh, and you know the 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 people who actually lived in mansions like the Breakers they kind of uh, uh, you know they hadn't been there for quite a while. So all of a sudden they were they were out of. They were out of ideas. They needed to figure out some way to attract people to their town, and they became much more amenable to to tourist style to tourist events, uh, like the Tall Ships in 1976. That was a big, uh, um, you know, that was that was a big that was a big beginning in like, oh wait, we can have hundreds of thousands of people in and around Newport. We can make this happen. So they came back in 1985. <clears throat> Uh, at this point, they were uh, the original nonprofit foundation still existed, and in fact, it still does. But they decided that um, no, you just run this as a as a commercial venture, and that was what happened. There was there was a there was an entire generation of people from the late '60s, young music fans from the late '60s. Now it's the mid '80s. They still have they still want to listen to music. They still want to listen. They still want to go to shows, and they're still buying records. But the pop music landscape wasn't slanted towards them. And the Newport Folk Festival was one of the ways in which it was demonstrated. Like, oh yeah, people over 20 still, you know, they're still out there, and they still buy records, and they still go to shows. 
Uh, obviously, the Indigo Girls, who played there nine years out of ten in the 1990s, they were a big deal. Uh, they were a big part of that appeal. And they were, um, you know, they, uh, they loved the festival. Uh, they told me, uh, uh, they told me that they were, uh, their favorite parts of the festival were not when they were playing. They loved to sit with their families and their friends and watch the other bands. And, uh, you know, and they, they, they loved it. I mean, they once took a year off and the only fest, the only show they played was the Newport Folk Festival. They said, oh yeah, we'll still, we'll still do that. Otherwise, uh, we're taking a year off. Um, by the time of the 50th anniversary, however, things were sort of winding down. It was becoming a, uh, it was becoming a, uh, a, attendance was going, I mean, if you've been to Fort Adams, uh, which is where they started having the festival in 1985, uh, the, when they revived it in 1985, Fort Adams holds 10,000 people. And if you've been there and you've seen it, you know what that feels like. Uh, it was 2005 that there were 3,100 people there on the last day. I mean, you couldn't, I mean, it was, it was rough. You couldn't get a good baseball game going in there. I mean, I, actually, you could have because you, you, you wouldn't have. You had room to run the bases. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just, yeah nobody would have gotten hit by a ball. On the other hand, you would have to have rustled up 18 people, and that's, that, that was a challenge by the end of that. Uh, so in, uh, in 2007, George Ween sold the festival, sold all of his festivals, and two years after that, the company he sold to went out of business. So the 50th anniversary festival is coming up, and boy, you know, it was a, it was a ramshackle affair. George Ween stepped back into the fray, and uh, they threw together something, and it was it was kind of beautiful because they did get Pete Seeger, and it was cl it closed with uh, it both days closed with Pete Seeger just being mobbed and gathered with this gathering of, of young players who were like a third of his age and, and twice as famous as he is, but they all just, they wanted to be with Pete Seeger and they wanted to, you know, they're, they're like learning the songs and they're like, oh my God, I get to play with Pete Seeger. And that was, it was a beautiful moment and I was, we were all very happy to find out that the festival would in fact continue after that because that was pretty up in the air. One thing George Ween did do is he got rid of most of the people who had been in the in the company that went out of business. But one of the people he kept was a guy named Jay Sweet, and he is in charge of the day-to-day -day operation of the festival now. And he's a young guy, and boy, can he talk. <laughs> but he also, he brought an entire new generation of performers